think about the early days of moonshine, they probably envision a rough and rugged mountain man carefully tending to a copper still by the light of the moon. Or they picture a fella in a souped up car roaring down Thunder Road with a trunk full of white lightning. That's right, it was a dangerous and risky line of work and it left many folks either dead or locked up in prison. The last person you'd probably think of leading a moonshine operation was a woman. Yet, one of the most notorious bootleggers of all time was one of the baddest women to ever call these Appalachian Mountains home. Oh, men feared her, and the law, they couldn't stop her. She was the Appalachian Queen of Moonshine, and this is her incredible true story. Mahala Mullins was born in 1824 near Sneedville, Tennessee. In her early life, her family thrived and lived a prosperous lifestyle in this remote, isolated area. However, by the 1830s, winds of change began to blow across these mountains. First came the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which resulted in a dramatic increase of white pioneers looking for new land to settle. A few years later, in 1834, Tennessee passed a series of new laws that made it even more difficult for non-whites to own land. Now, Mahala's family was caught right in the crossfire of these new changes. For one, they weren't black or white or Native American. They were Melungeon, a mysterious race of people, sometimes referred to as the Lost Tribe of Appalachia, and they baffled scientists and scholars for years up until this very day. Their physical appearance consisted of dark hair and skin, with blue eyes and a unique bump on the back of their head. To this very day, no one truly knows exactly where this exotic race of people came from or how they got in these mountains. Some have speculated that they were the descendants of shipwrecked Portuguese sailors, while others claim they were lost colonists from the Outer Banks. Other researchers claim that they were a mixed race of Indian and African, or even Mediterranean. Wild theories have emerged, stating that the origins of this race began when Hernando de Soto traveled through these mountains in 1540, while others contend that they might be the ancestors of Captain Juan Pardo, who brought an army of 125 Spanish men in 1567, and those men likely intermarried with Native Americans. Like I said, no one really knows how they ended up in this small area of the Appalachian Mountains. But one thing is for sure, once these new white settlers passed these new laws, suddenly, the Melungeons had no legal rights to the land that they had lived and worked on for generations. So they retreated to the backwoods, high up the mountain ridges, as outcasts in this new society. So it was, Mahala lived her entire life confined to a three-mile area atop a mountain named Newman's Ridge. This rugged lifestyle made Mahala as tough as nails. She worked just as hard or harder than all of her siblings growing up. And it was around this time that folks began referring to her as Big Haley. She was a big bone girl with a stout frame. There wasn't any woman who would dare mess with her. And as she grew into her teens, she was well over 300 pounds of solid muscle. Suddenly, there weren't many men who were brave enough to cross her either. It's said that whenever she sat down to eat a light meal, it wasn't anything for her to devour. A whole pig. Heck, she could rip a deep-rooted pine tree straight from the ground with one hand. 
and could splinter a two-inch oak board with her bare fist. Folks said she could take her arm and she could bend a forged iron crowbar with the same ease that any other woman might fold a silk ribbon. Simply put, Big Haley would have been a fitting match for the Hercules of the American lumber camps, Paul Bunyan. Once, when Big Haley was 17 years old, she attended a politician's re-election rally. Now back in those days, these events took on a carnival-like atmosphere to lure in the mountain folks. They would have all kinds of strongman events to determine who was the strongest man in the area. Mahala decided to enter the men's wrestling competition, fighting with a savage mountain-style assault that would make any brawny brawler think twice about getting in the ring with her. She proceeded to whip every man who dared to enter the ring. Once there were no more contenders left standing, she began fighting against two men at a time, where she continued the carnage. She was an absolute mountain of a woman. Her feats and strength caught the eye of a man named Johnny Mullins, who everyone knew as skinny because he only weighed 100 pounds. In a twist of irony, the small man won the big woman's heart, and the unlikely lovebirds were soon married. Mahala would spend the next 19 years of her life pregnant, with 20 pregnancies. Strangely, the more children she had, the bigger Big Haley became. 400 pounds, then 500 then 600 pounds. Many folks speculated that she was much heavier than that because nobody knew for sure. But soon, she was known as the biggest woman in the entire state of Tennessee. And with all these mouths to feed and her husband skinny, too weak to perform hard labor in the logging camps, Big Haley knew she had to take matters into her own hands. Living up high on the remote Newman's Ridge had some advantages for Big Haley's family. Her cabin was situated at the very top of the ridge. The closest railroad was nearly 16 miles away, and there weren't any roads leading up to the top of the mountain. To get to the top of the mountain, it was three steep miles that were nearly straight up. That's right. Any prospective visitor or outsider would literally have to rock climb to the top just to get to the homestead. Now while the soil was too rocky to grow too many crops, the apple and the peach trees thrived in countless great orchards on the mountain. Big Haley knew that it was impossible for her large family to consume the huge yearly harvest of apples and peaches, and it was impossible to transport them down the mountain to the market. But it would certainly be a shame to waste so many apples. So she took to making her own special recipe of brandy moonshine. Now, although Big Haley lived long before the prohibition of the 1920s, many states in Appalachia had already begun to make the manufacturing of whiskey and moonshine illegal as early as the 1850s, resulting in hefty fines of 10 to several hundred dollars or even prison time. But Big Haley's cabin was isolated enough that she was able to work her trade for quite some time with minimal interference from the law. Now, despite being illegal, Alcohol began to cause other problems for Big Haley's family. The combination of being raised by a rowdy mountain woman with an endless supply of alcohol was a volatile combination that made her children grow up as hot-tempered as her mama, and the best their daddy could do was just stay the heck out of the way. Her sons were heavy drinkers, and the more moonshine they drank, the meaner they became. One son died when his gun misfired during a brawl. As he tried to reload it, Another man slit his throat and drug his body to a deep well and threw him right in. Another brother was shot to death in downtown Sneedville during a shootout with the sheriff. And it seems it was impossible for the family to get away from the violence. One son went out to Texas, and once he got there, he was lynched. In another famous altercation, Big Haley and several of her sons had a shootout with the Confederate soldiers who had come to burn their cabin down during the Civil War. One of her sons had his finger blown clean off, and the other was shot in the leg during the gun battle. And that wasn't all. The family was known to turn on each other as well. One time, Big Haley's youngest son, Willie, got into an argument with his cousin, Coy. And the next thing anybody knew, Willie hit Coy over the head with a shotgun so hard that it popped his eye right out of the socket. Coy quickly pulled his 38 pistol and he used his only good eye to take aim and shot Willie dead. 
It's said that when news of Willie's death reached Big Haley, they handed her all of his belongings, which included a full bottle of moonshine. Big Haley took one look. Oh, it'd be such a shame to let it go to waste. I think I'll drink it myself. Indeed, to say violence was common would be a massive understatement. Yet, perhaps the biggest blow to Big Haley's heart was when her husband died. By this time, she was so big from what folks called the elephant disease that she was confined to her bed where she was propped up 24 hours a day. She had her three sons and her husband buried right in the yard so she could be rolled to the front door to witness her funerals. Now, just because Big Haley was confined to her cabin, it didn't slow down her moonshine operation. While most moonshiners would cut their products by adding water or other fillers, Haley's shine was absolutely 100% pure, and word spread far and wide about both its quality and its taste. When she sold you a gallon of moonshine, you got a gallon of unadulterated moonshine, not two quarts of moonshine with a quart of water and a quart of carbide all stirred up well and shook before drinking. Folks began flocking to Newman's Ridge just to get a taste of this famous shine. She kept a keg fully stocked right beside her bed with a faucet on it, and for 50 cents, she would pour you a cup right on the spot. Now, it was only a matter of time before the law stepped in to attempt to shut down her operation. Yet, once the revenuers climbed the steep mountain, they realized that Big Haley was too big. It would take a score of men to lift her. Even then, she was too big to fit through the front door of the cabin. Heck, even if they could have gotten her out of the door, there was no way they could carry her down the mountain. Time and time again, the courts issued warrants for her arrest, only to have Big Haley laugh at him and say, Go ahead, arrest me. Here I am, guilty as ever. I made this shine, and rest assured, as soon as you leave, I'm going to make some more. This process played out over and over again, the best the law could do was to tear down her steel, which her family would quickly rebuild for her. Frustrated, the county judge sent the county's most feared hotshot deputy to shut her down once and for all. And after the deputy failed to bring her in, the judge demanded an answer as to why he hadn't arrested her and brought her to justice. To this, the disappointed lawman replied, Well, Your Honor, she's catchable, but not fetchable. No matter how many warrants or rewards were issued, she was unstoppable, and folks came from as far away as Europe to get a taste of her legendary shine. Big Haley, Big Haley, so the best shine in the land. Then he climbed that mountain for a sweet contraband. She kept candy, apple brandy, and a cake inside her home. She was catchable, but not fetchable, so the law left her. So it was, Big Haley lived her entire life making shine in the small cabin far atop Newman's Ridge. Like a queen overlooking her vast kingdom of Appalachia, her fame had reached from coast to coast, down into Mexico and up into Canada, with folks making the pilgrimage to her cabin from all over the world. She was never arrested, and she made illegal liquor to the day she died at 74 years old. Now nobody knows exactly how she died. But the long-standing legend claims that she was poisoned by a jealous rival moonshiner. Even in death, folks didn't know how to get her out of the cabin. In fact, nobody knows for certain how they did it. Many folks claim they tore the chimney right off the cabin 
and removed her body through the hole. Others said they took her bed and used the wood to build a coffin, while others say she was buried in a piano crate. One thing is for sure, however they got her out. She was buried next to her husband and her sons right there in the backyard. That's right, even in death, she never came down off that mountain. So here we are, over 200 years since Big Haley's death. And folks are still fascinated with her story. So much so that in the year 2000, her cabin was brought down off of Newman's Ridge, piece by piece, and restored in Vardy Valley, Tennessee. Even today, you can visit her cabin. And while you're there, be sure to look up at Newman's Ridge. Even with all our modern technology, there's still no roads to the top where the Appalachian Moonshine Queen still rests underneath the apple and the peach trees. Never made.